Gaines performs a dance of bereavement, and Gates McFadden performs one of Constance's speeches from King John about a woman mourning the loss of her child as a consequence of war. that my tongue were in the thunderer's mouth. Then with a passion would I shake the world that cannot hear a lady's feeble voice. I am not mad. My name is Constance. This hair I tear is mine. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son. And he is lost. I am not mad. I would to heaven I were, for then tis like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could, what grief should I forget? For being not mad, but sensible of grief, my reasonable part produces reason how I may be delivered of these woes and teaches me to kill or hang myself. I should forget my son, or madly think a babe of clouts were he. I am not mad. Too well, too well I feel the plague of each calamity. And Father Cardinal, I have heard you say that we shall see and know our friends in heaven. If that be true, then I shall see my boy again. For since the birth of Cain, the first male child to him that did but yesterday suspire, there was not such a gracious creature born. 
and now will canker sorrow eat my bud and chase the native beauty from his cheek and he will look as hollow as a ghost as dim and meager as an ague's fit and so he'll die <coughs> and rise in so again when I shall meet him in the court of heaven, I shall not know him. Therefore, never, never must I behold my pretty Arthur more. Grief fills the room above my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Fare you well. Had you such a loss as I, I could give better comfort than you do. Oh Lord, my boy, my Arthur, my fair son, my life, my joy, my food, my all the world, my widow's comfort, and my sorrow's cure. <laughs> chapter of the National Organization for Women will introduce our next seat. I'm rather speechless right now with, with what we've been seeing, which is a problem because I do have to say something. Um, I must say that it is normal usually with what I do for there to be street demonstrations and for there to be a lot of rhetoric. And all of those things have their place, but what is truly remarkable <coughs> is cultural and social change. And this company is clearly proving that we're not going to ask men for power or for favors. We're going to do it ourselves and do it better, most often. <laughs> um, the next scene, and now I will read to you what I'm supposed to say. Uh, next, <laughs> next, we will uh, present a scene from Measure for Measure, directed by Diane Robinson, who's yeah. quite remarkable. Um, the scene of sexual blackmail is actually shockingly still too familiar to today's audiences. Um, there is a resonance to Isabel's dilemma of if I were to tell, who would believe me? I think we've all heard those lines in the last several years. Um, by making women's voices heard, the Los Angeles Women's Shakespeare Company makes an enormous contribution to having women's voices be heard. And it is an honor for me to be here. And it's very exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, measure for measure. think. I think and pray to several subjects. Heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel. Heaven in my mouth, as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception. The state whereon I studied is like a good thing, being often read, grown frayed and tedious. Yea, my gravity wherein let no man hear me, I take pride, could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain. Oh, place, oh, form, how often dost thou with thy case, thy habit, wrench off from fools and tie the wisest souls to thy false seeming? Blood. Thou art blood. <laughs> Let's write good angel on the devil's horn. Tis not the devil's crest. How now, who's there? One Isabel, sister, desires access to you. <laughs> Teach her the way. <laughs> Why does my 
blood must muster to my heart, making both it unable for itself and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness. How now, fair maid? I am come to know your pleasure. That you might know it would much better please me than to demand what is. <laughs> your brother cannot live. Even so. Heaven keep your honor. Yet he may live a while, and it may be as long as you or I. Yet he must die. Under your sentence? Yea. <clears throat> when, I beseech you, that in his reprieve, longer or shorter, he may be so fitted that his soul sit him not. <laughs> Fie, these filthy vices. It were as good to pardon him that hath from nature stolen a man already made, as to remit their saucy sweetness that to coin heaven's image in stamps that are forbid. Tis all as easy falsely to take away a life true made as to put metal in restrained means to make a false one. Tis set down so in heaven, but not in earth. Say you so? Then I shall pose you quickly. Which had you rather, that the most just law now took your brother's life, or to redeem him, give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she that he hath stained? Sir, I believe this I'd rather give my body than my soul. I talk not of your soul. Our compelled sins stand more for number than for account. How say you? Nay, I'll not warrant that, for I can speak against the thing I say. Answer to this. I, now the voice of the recorded law, pronounce a sentence on your brother's life. Might there not be a charity in sin to save this brother's life? Please you to do it. I'll take it as a peril to my soul that is no sin at all but charity. Please you to do it at peril of your soul were equal poise of sin and charity. But I do beg his life, if that be sin, heaven let me bear it. You, granting of my suit, if that be sin, I'll make it my mourn prayer to have it added to the faults of mine, and nothing of your answer. Nay, nay, but hear me, your sense pursues not mine. Either you are ignorant or seem so craftily, and that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Let me be ignorant and in nothing good, but graciously to know I am no better. Thus wisdom wishes to appear most bright when it doth tax itself. As these black masks proclaim and enshield beauty ten times louder than beauty could displayed. But mark me, to be received plain, I'll speak more gross. Your brother is to die. So. And his offense is so, as it appears, accountant to the law upon that pain. True. Admit no other way to save him, as I subscribe not that nor any other, but in the loss of question, that you, his sister, finding yourself Desired of such a person whose credit with the judge or own great place could fetch your brother from the manacles of the all binding law, and that there were no earthly means to save him, but that either you must lay down the treasures of your body to the supposed, or else let him suffer, what would you do? As much for my poor brother as myself. That is, were I under the terms of death, the impression of keen whips I'd wear as rubies and strip myself to death as to a bed that longing have been sick for, ere I'd yield my body up to shame. Then your brother must die. Tour the cheaper way. Better it were that a brother died at once and that a sister by redeeming him should die forever. Were you not then as cruel as the law that you have slandered so? Ignomy in ransom and free pardon are of two houses. Lawful mercy is nothing kin to foul redemption. You seemed of late to make the law a tyrant and rather prove the sliding of your brother a merriment than a vice. Oh, uh, pardon me, my lord. It oft falls out to have what we would have. We speak not what we mean. I something do excuse the thing I hate for his advantage that I dearly love. We are all frail, else let my brother die. Nay, women are frail too. Aye, as the glasses where they view themselves, which are as easy broke as they make forms. Women, <laughs> help heaven. Men their creation mar in profiting by them. Nay, call us ten times frail, for we are soft as our complexions are, and credulous to false prints. I think it well. And from this testimony of your own sex, since I suppose we are made to be no stronger than faults may shake our frames, let me be bold. I do arrest your words. Be that you are, that is, a woman. If you be more, you're none. If you be one, as you are well expressed by all external warrant, show it now by putting on the destined livery. I have no tongue but one. Gentle, my lord, let me entreat you. Speak the former language. Plainly conceive. 
I love you. My brother didn't love Juliet, and you tell me that he shall die for it. He shall not, Isabel, if you give me love. I know. Your virtue hath a license in it, which seems a little fouler than it is. Believe but me, others. on my honor, my words express <laughs> my purpose. Little honor to be much believed, and most pernicious purpose. Seeming! Seeming! I will proclaim thee, Angelo. Look for it. Sign me a present pardon for my brother, or with an outstretched throat I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. I will believe thee, Isabel, my unsoiled name. The austereness of my life, my vouch against you, and my place in the state will so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own report. And the smell of calumny. Oh! I've begun, and now I give my sensual race the rein. Fit thy consent to my sharp appetite. Let thy old necessity and pernicious blushes that banish what they sue for. Redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will, or else he must not only die the death, but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance. Answer me tomorrow. <laughs> Or by the affection that now guides me most, I'll prove a tyrant to him. As for you, say what you can. My false overweighs your true. Oh, to whom shall I complain? Did I tell this? Who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths! But bear in them one and the self same tongue, either of condemnation or of proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. I'll do my brother, though he hath fallen by prompter of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honor that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such a horrible pollution. <laughs> and Isabel, live chaste, and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request, and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. Ladies and gentlemen, L.A. X. Ballet.
Utter my thought. 
false. Why say they are vile and false, as where's that palace where into foul things sometimes intrude not? Who has that breast so pure, but some uncleanly apprehensions keep leets and law days, and in session sit with meditations lawful? Thou dost conspire against thy friend, Iago, if thou but thinkst him wrong, and makes his ear a stranger to thy thoughts. I do beseech you. Though I perchance ambitious in my guess, as I confess it is my nature's play to spy into abuses and oft, my jealousy shapes faults that are not. That your wisdom then from one that so imperfectly conjects would take no notice, nor build yourself a trouble out of this scattering and unsure observance. It were not for your quiet, nor your good, nor for my manhood, honesty and wisdom to let you know my thoughts. So what <laughs> dost thou mean? Good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, t'was something, nothing, t'was mine, t'is his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. By heaven, I'll know my thoughts cannot. My heart were in your hands, nor shall not, whilst tis in my custody. <coughs> ah! Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. That couple lives in bliss, who, certain of his fate, loves not his wronger. But oh, what damned minutes tells he o'er, who dotes, yet doubts, suspects, yet strongly loves. Why? Why is this? Think'st thou I'd make a life of jealousy? To follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions? No. To be once in doubt is once to be resolved. Exchange me for a goat when I shall turn the business of my soul to such exulfican and blown surmises matching thy inference. It's not to make me jealous, to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, is free of speech, sings, plays, dances well. Where virtue is, these are more virtuous. Nor from my own weak merits will I draw the smallest fear or doubt of her revolt, for she had eyes and chose me. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. When I doubt, prove. And on the proof, there is no more but this, away at once with love or jealousy. Why, I am glad of this. For now, I shall have reason to show the love and duty that I bear you with franker spirit. <clears throat> Therefore, as I am bound, receive it from me. I speak not <coughs> Wear your eyes thus, not jealous nor secure. I would not have your free and noble nature out of stealth bounty be abused. But to it, I know our country's disposition well. In Venice, they do let God see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to keep down none, but leave unknown. Just thus they so she did deceive her father marrying you, and when she seemed to shake and fear your look, she loved the most. So she did. Why go to then, she that so young could give out such a <laughs> scene to seal her father's eyes up close as oak, he thought was witchcraft. As I am much to blame, I humbly do beseech you of your pardon for too much <laughs> loving you. I am bound to be forever. Uh -huh. See this hath a little dashed your spirits. No, not a job, not a job. Trust me, I fear it has. <laughs> I am to pray you not to strain my speech to grosser issues nor to larger reach than to suspicion. I will not. Should you do so, my lord, my speech would fall into such vile success which my thoughts aimed not. Cassio is my worthy friend. My lord, I see you are moved. No. <laughs> not much moved. <laughs> I do not think, but there's Simona's others. Long live she so. Long live you to think so. 
<laughs> yes. How nature early from himself. I dare to the point. As the bold with you, not to affect many proposed matches of her own clime, complexion, and degree, where too we see in nature all things, what they smell and such, a will most rank, foul, disproportion, thoughts, unnatural. But pardon me, I do not in position distinctly speak of her. Though I may fear her will, recoiling to her better judgment, may fall to match you with her country forms that happily repent. Farewell, farewell! <laughs> If thou dost hear more, let me know more. Set on my wife to observe. Leave me, Iago. My lord, I take my leave. Why did I marry? <laughs> <laughs> this honest creature doubtless sees and knows more, much more than he unfolds. My lord, I would I might <laughs> To scan this thing no further, leave it to time. <laughs> Though it be fit that Cassio have his place, for sure he fills it up with great ability. Yet, if you please to hold him off a while, you shall by that perceive him and his means. Note if your lady strain his entertainment with any strong or vehement importunity. Much will be seen in that. In the meantime, let me be thought too busy in my fears, as worthy cause I have to fear I am. And hold her free, I do beseech your honor. Fear not my government, I once more take my leave. The <laughs> <laughs> fellow with exceeding honesty. <laughs> and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealing. If I do prove her haggard, so that her jesses were my dear heart strings, I whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Happily, for I am black, and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have. Oh, for I am declined into the veil of years, but that's not much. She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Oh, curse of marriage! That we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetite. I had rather be a toad <laughs> and live upon the vapors of a dungeon than keep a corner of the thing I love for others' uses. Yet tis the plague of great ones. Prerogative are they less than the face. Tis destiny unshutterable like death. Even then, this forked plague is fated to us when we quicken. But where she come? If she be false. Oh, then heaven mocks itself. I'll not believe it.